Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it gives me a uh, very great pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker at our Newman Lectures, His Eminence, Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor. Welcome to the University of East Anglia. If, I'll just, if I could just say a few words about uh, the Cardinal. Um, I think as a child he had a choice, if I remember, between being a pianist or a priest or a doctor, <laughs> like his father. And I think two of your brothers entered the priesthood. Um, as for the piano, I understand he's still an excellent pianist. But when it, <laughs> when it comes to medicine, I think the healing of souls uh, won over the healing of bodies. Uh, and so uh, the Cardinal was ordained in Rome in 1956. Uh, so later this year, he celebrates 60 years uh, of priesthood. Um, he was rector of the English College in Rome from 1971 to 77, Bishop of Arundel and Brighton from 1977 to 2000, Archbishop of Westminster from 2000, and raised to the Cardinal in uh, 2001. And it is such a great privilege for us to have you here, Your Eminence, to speak here. Um, last year, the Cardinal published his uh, memoirs, which are titled An English Spring, which is a quotation uh, from a homily given by uh, Blessed John Henry Newman um, on, the, I guess, on the state of things church following the, uh, the Restoration. Um, so it's, um, with that in mind, it's particularly appropriate that um, we have the Cardinal giving this uh, Newman lecture in which he will be drawing on his own memories of encounters with five popes of the modern age. Your Eminence, welcome to well, the thank University. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking this evening. Well, thank you very much for, for, for coming. I didn't expect quite so many of you, really. You know, there was a bishop once who went to a parish. Bishop Aaron, you won't know this, but he went to, uh, and there were, there were some functions. There were very few people there, so he said to the parish priest, Father, there are, very, there are very few people here. Didn't you tell them the bishop was coming? And the parish priest said, no, my lord, but the news must have leaked out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so whatever news has leaked out. Uh, anyway, uh, as, uh, as Deacon Andrew said, uh, I'm 60 years this year uh, a priest. And I, and I suppose I've lived through, like many of some of you here anyway, quite extraordinary times in the life of the church. Uh, I was ordained in... As, uh, in 1956, and uh, when I came back to England from Rome in uh, 70, uh, in 57, and it was the pre-Vatican II Church, liturgy in Latin, not much by way of ecumenism. Uh, the church was a, a city on the hill, you know. But, but uh, um, I remember going to my first as a curate. Parish, Parish priest was definitely not key to ecumenism, my friend. So he sent me along, and there were Anglican, two or three Anglican clergy, and a Methodist, and a Congregationalist. And anyway, they started a prayer, and this congregation said the prayer. He said, I like, I now like to pray for my uh, Anglican brothers, so, so, so kind and friendly, and, and my Methodist friend, so open to it. And then he looked at me and said, I, I'd also like to pray even for my Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. Uh, and, uh, so uh, I'm going to speak about my, myself a little bit, but also about popes I have known. My last year as a student, tell me if you can't hear very well, by the way, if there's any problem. Uh, um, uh, I went for, uh, on a GTA holiday up to Venice with some of the students. Um, uh, it was the end of August. Um, it was... Uh, Venice was absolutely wonderful. You know, was, uh, um, we came in by the Vaporetta. The next day was the feast of St. Lawrence Justinian, which is the uh, patron saint after St. John of, of Venice. And so the patriarch was coming, was rowed across by the gondoliers, all in his grand splendor. And he presided at the mass, but the man who actually presided, he was in choir, was, was somebody called... Um, well, it was Archbishop Montini. So Montini was the Archbishop of Milan, and this man Roncalli was the, the Patriarch of Venice. 
What I remember after the mass, they both came out on the balcony, and there was a huge crowd there, and, and they all cheered their beloved patriarch. But I remember Ron Kelly stepping back and he pushing Montini forward and, and saying to the crowd, "You, you would clap him. He's going to be the next pope." You know, everybody thought so. <coughs> Even at the uh, uh, but Pius XII wasn't into making cardinals uh, after, after and. Uh, uh, they even had, believe it or not, at the conclave in '58. They even had a plane at Milan Airport ready to take uh, the Archbishop down, even though he wasn't a cardinal. Um, uh, anyway, to everybody's surprise, uh, Ron Kelly was made uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third, and and I have to say, he was a breath of fresh air. Uh, things had got a bit stuffy, and uh, uh, Ron Kelly, he was human. He went first for his visit was to the prison. So one prisoner said, Father, I've, oh, Holy Father, I've committed murder. I will never be forgiven. He just went up and embraced him. And he was humorous. Somebody asked him, how many people work in the Vatican, Holy Father? He said, about half. But above all, I suppose, as we all know, he, uh, he called the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and... Uh, uh, there's a saying, but the future Pope Montini, who was working in the, in the Vatican, uh, uh, said, uh, said uh, this old man doesn't know what, what, what a hornet's nest he's got by calling the Vatican Council. But it, uh, it changed the whole, it changed the, uh, the church. The church had been living as a sort of counter-reformation church since the time of the Reformation and the Council of Trent. And it was a kind of a, uh, a kind of reaction to the Protestant, uh, and uh, and now for the first time uh, there was a feel. Uh, let's go much deeper into the nature of the church and its meaning, uh, and its uh, and its meaning for the modern world. And so we had the, those wonderful documents. One on the church. The church was no longer, as it were, a pyramid. Uh, the Pope, bishops, priests. Were, it was now much more the people of God, with everybody having a part to play. And then the liturgy, which was the supreme worship of the church, now able to be in the vernacular, and, and people were able to participate in the liturgy uh, in a new way. And so now we have in our parishes uh, women and men who are readers, Eucharistic ministers. Uh, it's a very different. Uh, and then we had the ecumenism. The ecumenism really hadn't been thought of. But I think Pope John thought by inviting the, 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 the other Christian leaders that things were going to get even faster than they were. But he did, and it made a huge impression. There's something in one of the documents. That there's no ecumenism worthy of the name without interior conversion, newness of attitude, and unstinted love. Beautiful. So we all had to, we all had to kind of think about how do we, uh, how do we unite with our fellow Christians as much as we're able to in a new in a new world. Um, so Pope John called the, the the council, and the first thing he he said, "I have no time for prophets of gloom." He 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 was a, he was an optimist, and uh, so. Uh, by the time the council was over, of course he died the second year of the council and um, the Pope Paul then had, had to continue it, and which he did. Uh, and it, it was very difficult. Some of you weren't, weren't around uh, after the council, but, uh, but Pope Paul, when did I first meet him? I'll tell you where I first met him. I was only 19 years old. I'd come from my first exam at the Gregorian University. All the lectures, by the way, were in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember my first, this exam, this lecture in Italian, he was a Jesuit, he asked me these questions, and I was looking at so, uti gui out non, yes or no? So uh, I thought of uh, when he asked what finished it, I said, uti gui, he shook his head, I said, non, he said, good. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, after it, with the other students, we went for a, a, a coffee uh, and a bun. We weren't allowed to go to these, what they call laterias, but we went uh, near, near the Trevi Fountain, which is near the university. We were sitting in there in our cassocks, and, uh, 
the Holy Land. And then this man came in, he had a ferriola on, and he went up and got a, uh, an espresso, and he saw us, and he came over, and in rather bad English, he really must have looked kind of very, he said, uh, uh, who are you? So we said, well, we're English students, so we've just come from our first exam. And he said, well, he said, uh, I work in the Vatican, my name is Montini, Monsignor Montini, and uh, I just want to welcome you to Rome, he said, you're obviously, quite, and, uh, uh, and I hope you'll be very happy here. Now, he could have said, he really shouldn't be in here, <laughs> <laughs> but that was Pope Paul. He wasn't, he, I think he was a wonderful Pope. Uh, he he had, had to deal with right-wingers and left-wingers, but, but he, he was welcoming to everybody. And I saw quite a lot of him when I was rector uh, later on the English College. And it was very different for him to implement the council. A lot of bishops, priests, were very re reluctant. And, uh, and he had to kind of do his best as he tried. He established the, <coughs> uh, the, the, the uh, synod of bishops. He went visiting different parts. Uh, but it was very, very difficult. I remember it particularly because I used to bring bishops in to see him on their ad limiters. And he, he was also encouraging to them. <coughs> I remember my predecessor, Cardinal Basil Hume, uh, when he came out, it was quite a shock to him, suddenly, from being uh, Abbot of Falls, suddenly to be Archbishop of Westminster. So he came out to Rome, and he was in a bit of a state. Um, so I brought him in to see Pope Paul, and uh, they spoke in French when I wasn't there, but he came out a different man. Uh, pope Paul had done what good popes do, do what the, <coughs> the Lord said to Peter. The Lord said to Peter, confirm your brethren. And that's what good popes do. They confirm the bishops. And he certainly confirmed uh, uh, Basil Hume, and, uh, and telling him to continue his Benedictine spirituality and not to be afraid. Uh, but uh, things were very, uh, very difficult for him. But uh, things... When I came back, I became the secretary to somebody called Derek Warlock. He was the Bishop of Portsmouth. And, uh, and Derek, Bishop Derek, was very keen to implement the council in every way. And the, uh, the Archbishop of Westminster at that time was somebody called Cardinal Heenan, uh, who I also met uh, a lot of those days. I remember but soon after being Bishop Derek's secretary, some chap came in, and he was a bit mad, I think, but he said, I, I, I hear that the, the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to preach at Westminster Cathedral. If he does that, he says, I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> so I thought, well, it will be. So he went off. So I wrote to uh, the, I said, Your Eminence, uh, I've just met this man, and he told me he's going to shoot the Archbishop of Canterbury you know, when he comes in the pulpit at Westminster Cathedral. <coughs> I just thought you ought to know. You know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got a letter back two days later. Dear Father Murphy O'Connor, do not worry. Those kind of assassinations only occur in Canterbury. Could you? <laughs> <laughs> Yours devotedly, <laughs> John Carmel. He did. Uh, but, uh, but things were, uh, were very different. Very different for him. Uh, he, uh, uh, <coughs> priests, many priests were leaving the, the priesthood. Uh, it was kind of a runaway church. There were people right, left, and center. In the wider church, there was a lot about uh, liberation theology, the Jesuits particularly in, in, South, uh, in South America. Uh, and uh, so when uh, I left uh, the, uh, to become bishop of uh, Arundel and Brighton, it was the, the end of a particularly difficult era from the, the council onwards until that time. And then, of course, we had the election. First of all, uh, we mustn't forget Pope John Paul I. Uh, and then, very quickly, uh, Pope John Paul uh, II, who kind of, the renewal, uh, he did things in his own way. For the point of, at a deeper level, I think he put the pause button on some aspects of the, of the Vatican Council. But uh, he, he was a force of nature, really, it was, it was Pope John Paul. Uh, he, uh, he did great things. Uh, he had meetings with people, leaders of other faiths, and ecumenism. We made a visit to Britain, some of you remember, 1982. <coughs> I was Bishop of Arundel. Gatwick was in, the, in my diocese, so I had to meet him. 
It went, I remember going on the plane, <coughs> and he was sitting like this. It was the time of the Falklands War, if you remember. And he thought there were going to be rotten eggs thrown at him, and, and, and uh, so I, I welcomed him. And, and of course, it went, it went uh, brilliantly. He, uh, it was the first time when he went all around England, Scotland, to Scotland and to, to Wales. The first time the British people had really uh, seen something, of, not just of the Pope, the first time a Pope had been in England, but, but the Catholic, uh, Catholic people of England, the, the millions who came of all kinds and sorts. It was very, very, it was very, very moving. When he went to, when he went to Scotland, he had a very, what a very uh, obviously, a typical Scots welcome, hugely. In, Edinburgh and then in Glasgow. And as he was leaving, there was a huge crowd at the airport. He was flying down to, to Cardiff for the last meeting with young people. And they were singing. They were singing, Will ye nay come back again? They kept singing it. So the Pope, he, he turned to Archbishop Winning, who was the Archbishop of Glasgow, and he said, Archbishop, what is that song they keep singing? So Archbishop Winning said, Holy Father, well, that's the song of the Scots people wanting Bonny Prince Charlie to come back again. And, and, and the Pope said, oh, he said, I met him last week. <laughs> I think, I think uh, wrong Charlie, you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'll ask people, what was the great gift of, of uh, Pope John, John Paul? He was very good with young people uh, because um, he gave the impression for young people that he was a free man, and that uh, this is what I believe, this is what I hope, this is what I, I teach, and, and if some of them went against the grain, no matter, this was the, the truth of the, of, the, of the church. I remember going uh, to Paris, for what, I went to a number of these youth days, the World Youth Days, there's one again this year down in Krakow, but the one I went to, one of the ones I went to was in, in Paris, and a huge crowd, French bishops were astonished so many young people turned up. And on the last night, uh, it wasn't, there wasn't a mass, there was a, uh, he baptized 10 young people, young adults, two from each continent. And, and so the French do things very, very beautifully. There was, there, was, there was music and there was uh, color and there were flags. And there were, this was at, it was at the race course. So. Anyway, there were 10 on, uh, in front of the Pope and uh, I still, remember him. As you know, every baptism you have to have the ask, do they believe? So he said, do you believe in God the Father of Almighty? And he's speaking in French. So they said, je crois, I believe. And then he suddenly turned around and said, et vous tous, he shouted. So, all of you. Well, they didn't know quite what to say. All the young people, uh, there was this sort of murmur. <laughs> then he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Born, suffered, and rose again. Je crois, said the ten. Every shouted. This time, a lot of them said, I believe, I was required. And then, do you believe in the Holy Catholic Church? We the saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Je crois, said the term. And then he got up very dramatic. He got up and put his hand. Every shouted. This time, or everybody said. And the point, what struck me was like many of us, really, young people, they don't really quite know whether, how, whether they believe or not. Uh, they do believe, but it's. But then they suddenly realize, well, it's not just me, it's our faith. And I love that also, that, I think it's on Holy Saturday, when the, the, the priest says, This is our faith. This is the faith of the church, and we're proud to profess it. So those young people suddenly realize that they're not alone, that this faith in Jesus Christ and in, in the church is something that's given to us, not just to me. And you're, not, you're never a church, you're never alone. And he, he, he was just he was just wonderful uh, about that. He was uh, uh, he was good about ecumenism too. I, I, I remember going about the then Archbishop Runcie to to uh, and to have uh, to have uh, to, to be at a meeting with him. And Bishop Archbishop Runcie said to me before going, this was in about 1988. I do want to raise the question of women priests. He said with the Pope. Uh, because it would be, if I go back and said I haven't raised the question. So we had lunch, and there were about 14 of us at lunch, and I was at the end, and the, the, the Pope in the middle, of course, of the Archbishop. And you know, when you have the Pope, you can't talk to your neighbor, this is just one conversation. So, uh, so we all sat down. I started off by saying, Holy Father, ah, 
accent. I met a friend of yours yesterday. Oh, who was that? I said, Ian Paisley. I said, yeah. <laughs> and I got a laugh. And anyway, the conversation went on, and we came to the end of the meal. I still, and still, the dreaded subject hadn't, uh, hadn't been. Uh, uh, hadn't been raised, so I thought I'd help my friend, Archbishop. I said, so I said Holy Father, yes. I said, well, he said, I'm a, a chairman of uh, ARCIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission. We agree about many things, but there's some things, of course, we do not agree about, uh, such as the ordination of women. And there was a hush all around the table. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, Archbishop rather said, Yes, Holy Father, blah, blah, blah. So uh, everybody had their say on it. And, uh, and then we always, what would the great man say? So, uh, so he said, he said, ah, he said, oh, he was a priest. And he turned to me and he said, and what is our kid going to do about it? <laughs> 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 End of conversation. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I suppose he, he uh, uh, you know, his bravery of the last years, you know, in, in his uh, very feeble and ill. I remember going to him for the last uh, last time I saw him, and uh, we spoke in Italian because he, he found it easier. He was wheeled in, <coughs> and I didn't really have any business because it was just a, a, a sort of courtesy visit. So I said, "Holy Father, when are you going to beatify uh, John Henry Newman?" He said, he, you need a miracle. He said, you don't have a miracle. I said, look, I said, Holy Father, the English aren't very good at miracles. <laughs> they think God's a gentleman. They don't want to bully him, I said. I said not, not like, not like, uh, not like uh, somebody like the Italians, I said. I said, when I was a student, I said, I went to see somebody called Padre Pio. His face lit up. Thank you, he said. So did I. So we talked about Padre Pio, who was, if you wanted a miracle, then you just pray to him. To uh, 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 so we talked about holiness, um, uh, and it just struck me. I was so glad for the last time I should be talking about Newman, Padre Pio, and here uh, uh, Saint now, uh, Pope John Paul. Was, uh, so he was a great man, and uh, <coughs> uh, and as it were, he he held uh, the, the, the difficult times in the church by the. Uh, by the way, he, he had his particular universal ministry, I think. and then, then he, then he died, and of course I went out for his, uh, uh, for the conclave. And Rome was incredible. As if anyone were there, there were about four million people had come to, to the funeral. It was, uh, and uh, so, uh, and the most of the time we did, we. We talked about none of the cardinals had been to a conclave before because Pope John Paul had, had uh, reigned, as it were, for so long. So we were all eager to what we were supposed to do. So, uh, and funnily enough, a certain Cardinal Ratzinger was the dean and he had to sort of uh, combine us all. So eventually we were there for the, for the funeral, very moving. Uh, uh, I greeted Prince Charles for the, for the, uh, he was out there for the funeral, and then Prince Philip came for. Uh, after the after the conclave, but then we we went we went in uh, to the conclave, and I suppose you know the only thing uh, uh, particular thing a cardinal is made a cardinal for is is to, to elect a pope, uh, and uh, so uh, I was given uh, a church in Rome when you were made a cardinal. I was made a cardinal in two thousand and one, uh, and so. I, we walked in to the Sistine Chapel, uh, singing the Litany of Saints, and we all had our places in that time. And it is quite, quite extraordinary, really, because you're you're facing the the Last Judgment. You know? So you go up before and you make your promise that you won't say anything about the voting, and before and you put your slip in to the urn, saying, "I, I believe this man should be the new." Supreme Pontiff of the Catholic Church. And this went on, we were, uh, after each, you had three scrutineers. There were two very movie moments, for, well, it was all very good for me. One was when the, the, the junior cardinal said there were a number of people in at the very beginning for uh, initial prayer. He said, Exeunt omnes, everybody out. 
So they all went out, and the door with a big thud was shut. And there was just 115 of us. And I looked around and I thought, we were all dressed in our scarlet. And, and, and I looked around and thought to myself, well, one of us is going to come out with a different coloured cassock. Um, and so the voting went on. And, and gradually, after the third, uh, the third voting, we had the one on the, the Monday evening, and then we went back and we talked after the first vote. Because everybody has a list of all the cardinals. So, so as the names were called out, you sort of give a little tick. And you just wonder, you know, are you on a Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we went on. And then the fourth, the fourth vote, or the fifth, one name, Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, kept me coming out. He had to get 77 votes. Two thirds plus one. Anyway, it went on and reached 70. By this time, there was a big hush. I said, you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, 71, 52. Then there was a pause. Other cardinals were, uh, names were called out. And then it came 77. Ratzinger. And it was a great, we all applauded. He's got his number of votes. And then the voting went on. But the most dramatic moment was then when the senior cardinal, the dean, went up to him. I can still see Colonel uh, sitting like this with his head bowed. And he went up to him and said, uh, Your Eminence, you have been elected as Supreme Pontiff of the, of the Catholic Church. Do you accept? And uh, he said, I accept as the will of God. And he said, What name do you take? And immediately he said, Benedict. So he must have thought about it the night before. <laughs> Mind you, between you and me, I think every cardinal had a name up his sleeve, <laughs> just in case. Uh, but then he went out, and behind the doors in, uh, at a conclave, there's the Vatican tailor, who has three cassocks, white cassocks, you know, medium, large, and small. Um, and after about ten minutes, he comes out again. And he, he's Pope, as you know. There's no, there's no anointing, there's no ceremony at all. He is Pope. Easily he says yes, he takes a name, Pope. And he sat in the middle and it was so extraordinary. We all went up and we kissed his ring and asserted our loyalty to, uh, uh, to him. And uh, uh, very, very moving. And it's all done so quickly. See, it's all done within uh, two days. Uh, so he spoke to us. By this time, of course, there's this little tunnel at the side uh, where, where the smoke goes up. I went over to have a look at that. And, uh, 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 so the white smoke had already gone up. So after speaking to us, he said, well, I must go out and greet the people. So we all followed him out to, uh, and uh, then he was his name, Nuncio Vobis Gaudium Manium. I announced you good news. We have a Pope who cried. And then he took it, it said who it was, and out he went. I was in the next window with other cards looking out. You know. Luckily I'm tall, so I threw the others aside. I <laughs> Uh, and then we went back to, he said, I want you all to come back. We, have, we had been living together in this, uh, we call it the Casa Santa Marta, which is a sort of hostel inside the Vatican. Uh, and, uh, so he said, I want you all to come back and have uh, dinner with me before we depart. So we all went back and we had, we had dinner. And then I was, I'll tell you this, <coughs> the chief, uh, again, the dean got up and said at the end, uh, please bring on the champagne, we must drink the, the health of the new Pope. <coughs> so they brought it up and we all raised our glasses. He said, is anybody, go is anybody going to sing? This is where I made my big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> There's something we sing, or I thought everybody would know, called Ad Multos Annos, which means uh, for many years, and uh, lots of, certainly the English know it, I thought everybody knew it, so I started this off. Nobody joined in. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a flash. But do I continue or do I stop? I continue. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then we sang uh, Oremus Pro Pontificia Nostra. So it was the most uh, incredible day. Pope Benedict, he's had a difficult pontificate in many ways. Uh, the last years of uh, Pope John Paul, who hadn't really been able to do very much, things had got out of, out of, uh, out of hand. And, uh, but I remember Pope Benedict for, for, 
for three reasons, really. Uh, one particularly, I, I remember him uh, coming to Britain. And you know, he was, uh, the papers were saying that we really don't want him, and he's, just, uh, he's a German and all that. But uh, in fact, he was very, very successful. I remember myself and Archbishop, now Cardinal Nichols, we went to see him. And, and he was said he was quite nervous about coming. And we said, well, we said, the, the Queen, I know, will greet you very warmly. And, uh, and your, your, your address, I, I, the most important one you'll give is the one in, in Westminster Hall. Uh, to, uh, which, and so by the time he arrived and the Queen uh, greeted him, and it, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. I remember Pope Benedict also for his addresses. He's the most, in, most intelligent Pope I think we've, we've had in centuries. I remember once after the uh, 82 visit of Pope John Paul to him, uh, I was asked to lead a group of uh, mixed uh, Anglican and pre-church leaders to go back to Rome. And what they wanted to do was to meet Cardinal Ratzinger. And they went in to meet him. He was the head of the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And, uh, and so he greeted them all and then said, said words of welcome. He said, you may have some questions. Well, did they have questions? You see, they were, so the, the Archbishop of York was there, John Hapgood, and all the other. So they, he gave a very difficult question. And then uh, they waited for the uh, Cardinal Ratzinger to arrive. He said, no, no, I want to order questions. So six of them, there were six of them. They gave their very, very <laughs> difficult question. And then for a quarter of an hour, he uh, answered every one of them uh, brilliantly. And I said, good night, that man is very bright. <laughs> He's extremely intelligent. And in a way, when he, when he retired, uh, or, or rather when he became Pope, uh, a bit of him was not too happy about it. I, I, was, I had lunch with our, then the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, with him. Uh, and uh, we were talking about this and that. And I said to him, Holy Father, how are you, how are you getting on with your book on Jesus? And his face was he turned very, he said, not too well. He said, I just have time, he said. I'd have to be studying. And so it was a, a real sacrifice for him, I think, to be, uh, to be Pope. Uh, uh, and of course, he then did what I think was the was the bravest thing uh, of, of resigning. No pope has ever resigned. I remember particularly his, his, uh, uh, he said the last address he gave in the Vatican Square in St Peter's Square. He, he talked about something of his life, and he said this: "There, in my pontificate," he said, "there have been moments of joy and light, but also difficult moments." I have felt like St. Peter with the apostles in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The Lord has given us many days of sunshine and gentle breeze, but there have also been times when the seas were rough and the wind against us, as in the whole history of the church it has always been, and the Lord seemed to sleep. Nevertheless, I always knew the Lord is in the bark, that the bark of the church is not mine but his, not ours, but his, and he'll never let her sink. You, uh, you see, I think <coughs> for us as, as, as Catholics, uh, uh, we used to talk too much, I think, about the infallibility of the church, the indefectibility of the church. The church will always be there. You can't say that in the, in the same way about, I think, other denominations, but within the particular ecclesiology of the Catholic Church, we know that the Holy Spirit uh, will always be there, and there will always be. Uh, the, the church as, as founded by Christ and will go on till the, till the end of time. Uh, so the interesting thing when, when he resigned, the Pope Benedict, <coughs> that because it was different to any other conclave, because there was no death, there was no funeral. So when we went out, we were all ready for action. You know, to, so we all met together. And, uh, uh, and there was a lot of anxiety. I, uh, I happened to know Pope Francis quite well because we were made cardinals on the same day in 19... And we used to sit next to each other at cardinals meetings. We got, uh, got very pally. Um, and as it happened, before we started the meetings, I went out for a, a meal with him uh, in, in Rome. And, of course, we talked about the coming conclave. And he never expected. You remember, he was 76, 77. Because uh, everybody was talking, we need a young... Pope now to get control and bring some order and 
governance to the church. Um, but then it did, it, it was very amazing. Uh, after a, a, couple, a day or so meeting together when the cardinals were expressing their very anxi great anxiety uh, about the church, uh, about the, the courier in Rome, about the, 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 the way things were getting disorganized and, the, uh, the, 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 and somehow the dignity of the church had been maimed by all kinds of things which you know about. Um, and then suddenly some of us thought, well, who are we going to have? Um, it's very funny, you know, uh, you're, you're 115. I didn't go into the conclave. I went to all the meetings before because I was a rating. No. But of course I was at all the, the meetings. And I soon thought to myself, there's only one man I can see who will be able to do this. Uh, we, we've got to get out of Europe. The church now is, is uh, worldwide. And, and uh, what I knew of uh, Carlo Bergoglio, as he was, and some others too, the other, gradually, uh, you know, if you're in these pre days before the council, the cards are all meeting uh, together <coughs> privately in in, uh, uh, in in their houses or in their colleges. And, and, uh, anyway, uh, when it came to the day, they went in, and I said to him, I was ne next to him at the mass before they went in, and I said to him, "Watch out," just very nicely, and he said, "I don't know what you're talking about, more or less. I understand." Anyway, I went in, and that was on the Tuesday. I, th I thought there'd be about two or three days before, uh, and, and I thought, anyway, I, I went and said Mass in my church. I have a lovely church. Every cardinal has a titular church in Rome, and mine's called Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. And if any of you go to Rome, please go to my church. You'll get a great welcome. Well, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, <laughs> but you might say a prayer, prayer for me there. It's uh, the only Gothic church in Rome run by the Dominicans. Um, and I, at six o'clock I said the Mass with students from the English College, a lot of parishioners praying for the cardinals. And when I came off the, uh, the altar, somebody rushed up to me and said, white smoke, white smoke. I said, oh. So the rector of the English College was there in a car. I said, well, we must go down. So, so, so we, and it was raining and we went down towards the to St. Peter's because we had to ditch the car because everybody else was going down. We just mm -hmm. couldn't drive, so I told them, you ditch the car, I'm, I'm walking down, so I had an umbrella. And it was an amazing experience. I'd not been at a conclave where I was I thought, outside it, as it were. So these vast crowds went down the, the, the Via della Conciliazione towards the square. The rain and lights, and I remember praying, and I said, whoever, and I said to myself, whoever comes out on that balcony, he's Pope, and he'll have my loyalty, whoever he is. And then we went, and then we had to wait. There was, there, of course, the, uh, uh, the BBC media were everywhere trying to get a word. And then eventually the, uh, the lights came on, and we knew that the, 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 the Pope had re we'd have the, um, the announcement. And I remember saying my prayers, and, and this card came out, and I said again, Nuncio Vobis Guardium Manion, uh, uh, good news. We have a pope, and everybody shared. And then he said, his name is Cardinal, his eminence Carlo Jorge Bergoglio. Nobody had ever heard of him. <laughs> so there was no shout or cheer at all. But then he came out and he said, what a sera. <laughs> he didn't start off by saying, you know, I'm the pope, I'm gonna give you a break. No, good evening. Uh, immediately put himself, as it were, on the same plane as the, uh, uh, as the others, and and, uh, he, uh, and he spoke about being the bishop of Rome. He didn't say I'm the pope. Now that's very important, for the, particularly for the Orthodox, because there were long difficulties with the uh, the See of Peter, and uh, uh, and then he said uh, something like, uh, I, "You've gone a long way to get a new bishop." <laughs> he said, uh, and then he said, "I want you to pray for me." And it was, it was most moving. It was just a 10 minute speech. And uh, I filled with joy. I thought, this man is going to change things. And I think that he's been really uh, a breath of fresh air for the, for the Catholic Church. He's, uh, why? Because he has sort of kicked the ball in a different direction. All of my lifetime as a priest and as a bishop, uh, there's been the, the Vatican Council, which is the greatest event in the, in the last 
couple of centuries of the church, has never been fully implemented. And three great things about the Vatican Council uh, are, are what they call collegiality, synodality, and subsidiarity. Collegiality, which is the Pope ruling with the bishops. We are cum Petro as well as sub Petro. We're under Peter, but we're with him. And that needs to be, with Peter, needs to be, the, the church had been, become too centralized. And so he set up the, the, the nine cardinals from different uh, countries to, to help him in, in some of his plans for the church. And then the synodality. The difference with the synodality now, as he's trying to do it, is that he's making sure that the, uh, the, the bishops of each country, that they listen to what the people are saying. In other words, the faith of the people of God, that has got to be communicated out there, so that what comes out of a synod is really the faith of the church, which is pronounced by the bishops. So it's a new form of synodality. And uh, we've seen uh, last week with the, the, the latest uh, exhortation of the Pope on, on the, the on the love and, and, and marriage and uh, how he's listened uh, to all, what all the bishops were saying. And so we have a new tone, no change, but a change of attitude, a change of approach, crucial and so, so important. Uh, so synodality, a collegiality, and the other thing is subsidiarity. As the church, as I said, become too centralised, and bishops have got to feel free to be bishops in their own countries. Uh, uh, that's always been true, but I think it's it's going to be more uh, emphasised in, in the in the years uh, in the years to come. Um, and you know, Pope Francis has, the great thing about him is that he touches everybody really, where they are. I was walking along the street in Chiswick, where I live in London. This fellow stopped me. Oh, oh, Carl, he said, I don't know, I know he's a Catholic. Right? This new Pope, he was, he said, I like the cut of his jib. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, uh, uh, just about who you are, he sees that things are happening in uh, Lampedusa. He get, get, gets a plane and goes down there. Uh, he talks with the, the, the atheist uh, um, editor of the Catholic, the, the, the um, Italian newspaper, the Messagero. And how, how do you deal with uh, atheists? You don't start me talking about God. You talk about what's good? That's the word, the word God comes from good. What is good in your life? How do we bring things along? He always wants to bring things along. I like the little story when he got up one morning, uh, at half past five, whatever it was. He went outside his room, and, because he doesn't live in the palace, he lives in this hostel, and outside was the Swiss guard. So he said to him, how long have you been standing there? So the Swiss guard says, well, I've only five been standing here for four hours. Oh, you must be very tired. I'll get you a chair, says Pope Francis. So he said, so the, the, the man says, oh no, I, I, can't, I can't sit down. Why not? Says the, well, the captain of the guard says, I've got to stand. So the Pope says, Pope Francis says, look here, he said, I'm the captain of the captain. <laughs> <laughs> so he went out, got him a chair, then he went in and he found a sandwich and brought him out a sandwich. Very simple, very... But people feel that Pope Francis will understand them in the, in the trials and the troubles and the little things that happen uh, in life. I was found it particularly, I think, with the, this year of mercy, which has been, to say successful is the wrong word, but it's touched people in different ways. Uh, the... the uh, uh, asking people to open the doors of your heart to the mercy of God. Uh, it's, uh, there was a, one of the books about a, an interview with him, by a <coughs> Jesuit. He asked the, the Pope, he said, who are you? And, uh, <coughs> the Pope says, uh, who is, and he said, who is Jose Bergoglio? And he said, I don't know. What's the most fitting description? He says, I'm a sinner. You may a sinner who the Lord has looked upon. Beautiful. And, and you can say that for all of us. You know, we all have pebbles in our shoe. And we need, the, uh, we need to be free to, to accept the mercy and the love of God and to show it to, to others. Uh, I'm going to stop in a moment. I feel you probably had enough. But I'd like to end 
with a, a story I rather like, not about Pope Francis, but about Pope John. Pope John uh, was 77 you know, when he became the Pontiff. Anyway, he had, he had a party in the Vatican for his 80th birthday, and he invited uh, everybody in the, the Curia to come and celebrate with him. But he also asked uh, a little group from his little village, Sotto Il Monte, you know, to, to come down. So there they all went into the party, and Pope John, small and squat, comes in, and, and this little group from Sotto Il Monte, peasant people, looked a bit out of place. But what does he do? He goes up to them, and he says, uh, I want to talk to you first. I said, what about all these? I'm so glad you've come, he said. And if, you know, if, if things were different, I could have taken you all out. And we could have had a, uh, some pasta together and some vino and talked about old times. But we can't always do what we want to do. He said, when I left Sotri Del Monte as a, a young, young man, I went to the seminary and, and it was very cold. And the food was awful. And I used to say to myself, Angelo, his name was Angelo, wrong town. Angelo, this is no place for you. But then I thought, well, God's brought me here. I must trust him. So I stayed. I was ordained a priest. Then I became the bishop's secretary. And uh, I used to drive him around and do all his work, this, that, the other. And I thought to myself, well, this, Angelo, this is no place for you. But I thought, well, God's brought me here. I must trust him. So time went on, then he said, then, and then I was made a uh, papal nuncio, and I was 10 years in, in Bulgaria, 10 years in, in, in Turkey. He said, it was very boring. Uh, uh, very, very boring. And, uh, and I used to wake up and think, well, what am I, not much to do, especially in Bulgaria. And how often did I say to myself, you know, Andrew, <laughs> this is no place for you. you know? <laughs> but uh, when God brought me here, uh, I must trust him. And then, out of the blue uh, came a, a call from uh, Pope Pius XII to, to go as nuncio to Paris, which was a big step. And he got the, he got the, 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 the telegram from Rome, and he didn't believe it, thought they were having it on, because he was very, you know, he wasn't regarded as a high flyer at all. So he didn't go, so they had to send another one. <laughs> um, um, so he went to Rome, saw the Secretary of State, he said, what's all this about me going to Paris? So he said, he said, you may well ask, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he had to get there. He had to get there before the 1st of uh, January. This is 1945, I think. Uh, to go, we, we had refused a number. Of, and he, he wanted the nuncio there because uh, uh, he had to, the, the, the doyen of the diplomatic service was to give a speech. And, uh, and if, 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 if the nuncio wasn't there, the Russian was the next in line, so he didn't want him. So, so what did he do? He, he, he goes to Paris, he arrives on the 31st, and the first thing he does, he goes to, he goes to the Russian ambassador who had his speech prepared. He said, well, Your Excellency, uh, you know, I've just arrived, I'm afraid I have to give the speech. I wonder if you let me have your speech. <laughs> so, the, so he took the, 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 the Russian speech, put in God here or there, <laughs> and gave the speech. And it became a great, a great success in Paris, like known by the other cardinals. So, uh, but anyway, he, he carried on this story. You know, this is no place for, for you. And then he said, then he, he, he talking to this little group, then he said, then Pope, my predecessor, said, Pope John, uh, Pope, uh, Pope, uh, Pope, who is it? Pius the Twelfth died. And, uh, and we all came down for the, for the conclave. And as we went in, I said to myself, they wouldn't, would they? <laughs> but they did. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. Uh, amongst you, uh, and uh, not my will, but the will of the Lord. And, uh, and his point was, uh, he said he finished up by saying something like, "I am where I where, where, where the Lord has called me to be." And then he said, "And you are where the Lord has called you to be, and we must trust Him." It was most beautiful. Somebody told me that who was there. I was actually there myself, and so I think we have a message through from. Pope John, through the other popes, through the, the living out of the church, with all its ups and downs, uh, to Pope Francis. And I think we should be very, very grateful uh, for uh, 
the papacy, I'm not just talking about Francis, I'm talking about these other popes who all had difficult pontificates uh, and, uh, and know that the, the, the Lord will never abandon his church. He's not asleep. He may be asleep, but he, the boat's not going to sink. So we, I think we should be, in spite of the challenges facing the church, we should all be rejoice uh, and be glad because the Lord is with us and this is the day that he's made. Thank you. Um, actually, that was a very interesting talk. But um, a few years ago, we were in the Orkney Islands and we went to a lecture by the local Roman Catholic priest. So, where were we? To the Orkney Islands. Yeah. And the theme of his talk, really, was that the most important thing for the Catholic Church was to maintain the orthodoxy. Was maintain? The orthodoxy. Uh, could you comment on that, please? Well, clearly, uh, uh, any, anyone who's ordained a bishop is, is ordained also to complete, uh, uh, to preserve in, in integrity the faith of the Church. And, uh, so uh, it's why nuncios and the looking out for a bishop is always one that they will choose who is orthodox. And I think a bit, every bishop feels that uh, a very great, not, not a weight, but a responsibility. You know, the most important thing a bishop does, which I centered on Easter Sunday, is to, to state that Jesus is risen. And that's what Peter did all over in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and in the same way, uh, the bishop is a, a sign for the people and he's got to assert the, the resurrection of Christ. And, and, and of course, the deposit of faith, the Trinity, the incarnation, the uh, uh, resurrection, and, and those fundamental things of the faith in, in the sacraments and in the word. So, uh, yes, it, it is very important. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. Uh, Peter Dyson, a Catholic from Great Yarmouth Parish. I worry sometimes that the Pope is enigmatic in his often off-the-cuff remarks. Who am I to judge? Remarks like that. Um, which causes a great deal of speculation among Catholics and others who wish that the Catholic Church perhaps wasn't the Catholic Church quite, um, and all sorts of speculation runs round and then it dies down. My worry is that the Pope runs the risk of going down in history when his papacy is over as a Pope who promised much but in practice uh, left things largely as they were. <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you for that question. I think the first thing I'd say is, and <clears throat> one sees it from this document, which he's issued on, on love and, 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 and marriage, is that the Pope in no way, nor have the bishops who were at the Synod, changed anything of discipline or doctrine. In fact, if you read this document, and I'm going to make a great confession to you. I've, read it, I've, re I've not read it yet. Because I read the, the, the summary around it, because the Pope says you, you mustn't rush it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so I think you all ought to read it. I can see there the faith of the church. Now, now the, what there has been, a ch I call it a change of development, uh, is that uh, he's also looked, because of people, uh, at the people in difficult situations, in what part of it, the, the divorced and remarried, uh, people in, in living together without in marriage, all those things which we all know about. And what is he saying? He's saying, he's not saying he condemned them all. He's saying, I think first of all, that they're part of the church and we must help them to, to be more fully part of the church. And I think he's also saying, in certain cases, it's quite difficult to judge. There is, when you're dealing moral matters, and every wise parish priest knows that there's such a thing as an objective truth about the rightness and wrongness of actions, but there's also a subjective. Uh, what, is, what is the, uh, the moral uh, badness or, of, of this particular action, according to... And, you know, uh, 
that's where I think the Pope is saying, bishops and priests particularly, but also they must discern uh, uh, a particular situation. Now, and a lot of there have been a lot of talk about the divorce and remarried and re admission to communion. I think that's a very delicate thing. The Pope hasn't said that they can, but he said we've got to discern sometimes in particular situations. Uh, for instance, you have a, a woman who's married with, and, and with a couple of children, that, and the husband moves off with somebody else, and she's left, and she marries again. Now, what are the circumstances? At the moment, she can never. Now, I think I'm not saying that she ne necessarily may go to Holy Communion, but, but he's saying there are maybe a, a cases. Uh, because judging the, uh, the subjective, uh, where the, a greater discernment must be made, and I think uh, on the, I think people are glad about this. I think people are glad about this. And this so, so uh, if you say, is the Pope whittling down the faith? I, I don't really think so. He's just emphasising the mercy of God and also re recognising the difficult situations uh, that people are in, and, and say, let's start with them where they are. Uh, and not say you're, you're out, you're just saying that you're, in fact, we want you to be more integrated into the life of the church. Now, whether that means receiving Holy Communion is another matter. Uh, but uh, I think most people are rather glad that there has been that kind of attitude of mercy for the, for the people who are in uh, uh, difficult and distressing uh, situations. We could have, a, I think we need another talk about that. It's very, <laughs> very important, uh, very important matter. Thank you for, for Thank that. Thank you. Hello, hi. Um, fascinating. I'd love to hear you speak. I'm a little bit nervous, but um, I just wondered what you were thinking about uh, gay people in the Roman Catholic Church. It seems that some of the things that appear to be changing, that one appears to be harmony. I'm sorry, if you can't hear me the whole thing. It was the attitude of the church towards gay people right. where the, the questioner wondered whether, in fact, rather than softening, uh, the situation was get, was becoming harder. And additionally, the reason I'm asking you, Eminence, is because I work as a chaplain, so it's actually quite an important issue, both to health and well-being. Thank you. Well, I'm not quite sure the, the question. I think that every, again, I go back to parish priests. If you have a person who is gay in, in a parish, I don't think a parish priest would be wise <laughs> to say, you're not part of the church, you're out. I think they would try to integrate them. And the judgment as to the the sinfulness of, 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 of those actions is something that should only be uh, accounted for in the privacy of the confession or the pri privacy of the, of the discussion. Uh, and I do think uh, that uh, you mentioned there the Pope saying, uh, you know, who am I to judge? Now, uh, obviously that has been interpreted. But there is a sense in which, uh, when, and every wise priest knows that, that uh, that, that you've got to make a judgment according to the, the, the particular uh, situation and uh, the, the sort of efforts that a person is made to live a good life. That's what the Pope is saying. Uh, even though he she may be living in a, a, in a, a irregular situation. Uh, so I think it, it is quite it is quite delicate. Well, you say that things are difficult for homosexuals, yes, but I think I think the Pope is showing a greater understanding of that without taking away. Uh, the, the, the discipline of the Catholic Church about homosexuals. I, I'm sure you'd all like to join me in thanking His Eminence for what I've noticed one of our, one of, one of our tweeters has called a marvellous and stimulating uh, and interesting talk. I'm sure you'd all echo that and thank you so much. Thank you.